Parking here I Um, Hello, sports fans, sports collectors, and all hobbyists. Uh, Welcome to the Car King Sports and Variety Show. I am your host, the Catman, Brian Catequit, a.k.a. the Car King. We are live on ABC's KMET 1490 AM.com, your number one spot right here for news and talk on the West Coast. I thank everyone for tuning in this morning. On the telephone line, I welcome back to the program uh, the former legendary pitcher of Notre Dame, member of the 1960s uh, Pittsburgh Pirates and Houston Astros. I welcome back uh, Frank Carpin. Frank, always an honor to have you. Thanks for being on. Well, thanks for inviting me back. And and by the way, before we get started, I have to tell you that I receive several requests for autographs every week and have for many years. But after I was on your show last time, I got several requests from people on the, the West Coast who specifically mentioned that they heard my uh, interview with you on the uh, on the radio really that's fascinating really that's that's good to hear so people are tuning in and you know you're still a fan favorite which is good to know um so yeah that's interesting to know but but frank you know the last time uh, you were here we didn't delve into your houston astros uh you know season so i figured 1966 uh you know they finished eighth place I mean, you had those uh, notable stars on that team, Robin Roberts, Joe Morgan, Staub, Frank Carpin. Uh, talk, about, uh, le- talk about, again, you know, how you ended up with Houston and playing alongside some of those uh, legendary names. Well, after the uh, 1965 season, I was working in, you know, Richmond, Virginia, my hometown. And I get a phone call from Joe Brown, the general manager of the Pirates. And he said, Frank, just want to give you a heads up. You had a fine season with us, but we need your spot on the roster. We have a young phenom that we need to protect. But you'll be in spring training with us with a chance to make the ball club just like you did this this year. And I said, well, Coach, who, uh, I mean, uh, Joe, who you, uh, who's the young phenom? And he said, Manny Sanguian. And I said, as we learned later, that was a smart move by Joe Brown. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, I was eligible, I was eligible for the draft that year, and uh, Paul Richards was the general manager of Houston, and Lumen Harris was the manager. Well, both of those had been with the Baltimore Orioles, and don't forget, I was in the Yankee farm system for six years, and I had pitched in spring training with the Yankees three years. And oftentimes I'd face the Orioles because they were close to Fort Lauderdale. Uh, They trained out of Miami in those days. So Richards had a chance to see me pitch, and so did Lumen. And then I did have a couple of good uh, relief appearances against the Astros uh, with the Pirates. So when the draft came up, they drafted me. Right after the draft, right after the draft, Judge Hoffheins fired both of them. Is maybe not right? because they maybe maybe not because they drafted me, but for other reasons. Uh, so anyway, so I went to spring training with Houston. I didn't know anybody, and they didn't really know me because there was all new coaching staff, new general manager. But you know, I did go to spring training, and I went you know n- you know north with the team uh, for the first month of the season. But they had uh, they had some older pitchers. They had a had to make decisions on. Robin Roberts is the one you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So they sent me down to Oklahoma City, and I was down there for two months, and then they called me back. And I finished almost the full season with the Astros. But what developed with me was when I was in the minor leagues, I started swelling up in my elbow after, after, you know, pitching appearances. And when I got to Houston... The first thing Grady Hatton said after he saw me pitch one night is, hey, you don't look like the same guy we saw in spring training. And I said, well, I'll be honest with you, my arm has been swelling up after performances. So he sent me to the doctor, and the doctor says, you got an arthritic elbow and you're developing bone chips. So you probably should just go home, and we'll take another look at it in the spring. So they sent me home with before the end of the uh, 1966 season. Of course, when I got home and I started reflecting, I had a Notre Dame degree, I had three children, and I was expecting a fourth. 
My wife told me my oldest son is going to start grade school. I want him to start in Richmond, not somewhere on the road. So I made a decision. I called the Astros and I said, I voluntarily retire. And they said, oh, yeah, everybody says that. And then, you know, if we, if you change your mind, it takes 120 days or whatever number uh, to get back on the active roster. I said, no, I'm retiring. You can count on it. So that's how my career ended with the Astros. Um, and, you know, for, before the end, of, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, you're right. That that team had some aging pitchers. I mean, uh, Robin Roberts was almost 40. 40 years old, then, you know, uh, Bob Bruce is another one. He was in his mid-30s, and here you are, Frank Carpin, you're like in your late 20s. You're right, and also Turk Farrell, I don't, you, you remember that name, one of your teammates, Turk Farrell, he was uh, in his 30s. They had some aging pitching in that squad. Who could forget, well, Robin Roberts is, you know, a great. Bob Bruce actually ended up being probably my closest friend on the team, and who could forget Turk Farrell mm-hmm. when – the story you remember the story about him. You know they were always worried about when they were getting on airplanes. There was uh, you know a lot of disruption going on, and Farrell had evidently got him into trouble one time. So the next time he went on a plane, he put a tape over his mouth <laughs> so he wouldn't make the mistake. He wouldn't make the mistake of saying the wrong thing and jeopardizing the, the flight. <laughs> so everybody remembers Turk Farrell. <laughs> Turk Farrell. And how about Mike Qu- Qu- Cuellar? He was great. Well, you know, I ran into Mike about 15 years ago. I, went, I started going to Florida as a snowbird, and it was a charity golf tournament in Venice every year. And I ran into Mike playing in that, that particular tournament. And the amazing thing about Cuellar is he's one of those really great players that developed from those years that never reached his potential until he left the Astros. You know, you had a you had about a half a dozen guys on that team that were future stars, but they never developed until they left the team. I mean, Quayar three years later uh, goes to the Orioles and he wins the Cy Young along with Denny McLean. They split it. I think it's the only time that's ever happened. And there were others. I mean, come on, Rusty Staub was on that team, oh, Joe yeah. Morgan. Jim Wynn, Larry Durka, um, Dave Justy, he ended up helping the Pirates during the 70s, uh, you know, go to several World Series. But none of those guys, as good as they were, and never improved the team. As you pointed out earlier, I think we finished eighth. Next year they were ninth, and next year they were, were tenth. And it's hard to believe that with those kind of players. No, oh, absolutely. You know, and back in the 60s when I believe baseball was baseball, I mean, here you had Frank Carpin, who, by the way, is on the telephone line with us this morning. You have Frank Carpin. But, Frank, we got to remind our audience uh, who missed the last time you were on, You got we got to remember that you basically blossomed in the New York Yankees farm system in the late 50s, right, which you hated the Yankees. Well, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> and Jackie Robinson was my idol. And as you recall, the Dodgers had a lot of frustration with the Yankees during the 40s and early 50s. So I was a Dodger fan. Even though I moved as a young boy to Richmond, Virginia, I was raised there. I mean, I never lost my uh, you know, attraction to the Dodgers. Uh, but when it came time to you know, the sign... Uh, a Dodger scout came up to me at the University of Wisconsin where Notre Dame was playing that weekend, and he asked me what kind of money I was looking for, and I gave him a figure. He turned around, walked away, and I never heard from him again. So when the following uh, that summer, I played in the uh, Basin League in South Dakota where all the college kids went, you know, and there was a revival and interest in my signing, and it just started to the wheels started rolling, and it turned up the Yankees made me my best offer. So it was like, hey, they made the best offer. My dad was a was very big fan of the Yankees. And so that's why we ended up signing with them. But, but also, is this true? The Tigers also wanted to obtain you. They were after you, right? Well, there was a reason for that. The yeah. general manager was a, was a Notre Dame graduate. John McHale, and uh, he called, and he said, 
what's going on? And I said, uh, well, my Yankees have offered me $33,650. And he said, we'll give you 32000 more. And I said, well, I thank you, but I, I think I'm going to have to sign with the Yankees because my father has made a commitment to them that if they reached a certain figure, I would sign. And then he said to me, okay, how much do you want? I said, no, sir, you, you're misunderstanding. We've given that word. He said, well, good luck, Frank. I think it's your dad that wants you to sign with the Yankees. So anyway, I uh, that's why I signed with the Yankees. Now, now, let me ask you this. This just came to my mind, Frank. Do you believe if you went with Detroit, do you believe your career would have lasted longer? Well, I think my career lasted as long as it did, mainly because of injury. And I don't think it mattered which organization I was in. Uh, although the manager I had my first year in the Carolina League definitely got fired because of the way he handled me asking me to pitch relief the day after I pitched nine innings twice. And the Yankees found out about it, and they fired him. Now, whether that all contributed down the road to the, to injury, who knows? I mean, those injuries occurred uh, seven, six years later. Uh, but, but as far as the Tigers are concerned, remember one thing. A young pitcher came into the Carolina league that year, mid-year. His name was Mickey Lolich. Mm. So I would have been in competition with Mickey Lolich. In the, when I was in the Sally League in 1963 with Lynchburg on loan to the White Sox because the Yankees had given up on me, I had gone from a prospect to a suspect. But who comes in the middle of that year up from Seaball but Danny McLean. So, you know, McLean, Lowich, uh, I don't think I'd have been any better off, no. And I think my career was affected by the injuries I had rather than who I was, what association I was in. Interesting. Um, now, going through your minor league stats, uh, which look, you know, it looks pretty good to me here. Uh, you start out at Greensboro, uh, twelve and nine record, three point two four ERA. I heard you say that uh, in Greensboro, the travel was easy. You like playing for Greensboro, right? Well, it was a bus league. You never spent some place overnight, except when you went from Greensboro to Wilson. And then you'd play Wilson, and on the way back, you'd catch Raleigh. But you, and you played uh, Burlington, you played Winston-Salem. Those were all like day trips. I mean, after the game, you came back home. It was very easy. It was a, the Yankees uh, did me a, a big favor in one respect in putting me in the Carolina League because travel was very easy. Now at Binghamton, you go. Your record is eleven and eight, uh, three point six something ERA. Uh, did you enjoy playing in Binghamton? Binghamton was was the usual step in the Yankee progression. You know, you B ball, then they're going to move you to A ball. Then if you do good, you're going to move you to Triple A. So you know, in those days, they took you a little slowly. But I had two years of college. Don't forget, I didn't sign out of high school. I went to Notre Dame, signed after my sophomore year. So they started me a little higher, and they told me in spring training the first year, we're going to start you a little higher than we normally do. They usually took kids, put them in D-ball, then moved them to C, moved to A. You know, in those days, they took you very along very, very slowly. So I started a little higher, and I moved to A. Then I moved to AAA. The problem I had is that in 62, my second year in Richmond, I had I basically had a terrible year. It was the one year I, I felt like I didn't really perform well as a professional. <clears throat> I mean, I was at 3-14, and 14, I think, that year. And that's the year that the Yankees basically gave up on me. But, but Frank, wasn't that, the year, wasn't that the year you were on the disabled list? You hurt your arm. No, that was. Uh, Wasn't it that season or? No, you're correct. No, no, I think you're correct. Uh, you were on the disabled list for six weeks, no, I, think. I think. I think 61. Okay. 61, 61, my first year in AAA. After my first game, I had a shoulder problem with bursitis in my left shoulder. 
spent about six weeks on the disabled list, then came back and ended up strong. I ended up strong that year. Uh, and then the following year, I, we go to spring training with the Yankees again, and Houck sat us down, sat three of us down, Jim Bouton, Hal Stowe, and myself. And he said, I'm taking one of you three guys. You're going to be the long man in the bullpen. Well, he made the right decision. He took Jim Bouton. Bouton was, was the right, right choice in those days. Uh, I went back to Richmond, had, I don't know whether it was a letdown, not making the Yankees, whatever. But I had a horrible year. But the year before, 61, is when I had the injury, right, which so I got I, over, now, which I got over. Now, in Richmond, that's when you became a relief pitcher? No, here's what happened. Go ahead. 62, I couldn't get anybody out. The Yankees gave up on me. Go to spring training in 63. They sit me on the bench in Augusta, double-A ball. I didn't even pitch relief maybe one or twice. Cut down day. Rube Walker, the old Dodger catcher, uh-huh. says, Frank, we can't send you back to B-ball because you do But we can, what we're going to do is lend you to the Lynchburg White Sox in the same league. In fact, that we're playing them tonight. I packed up my bags and went from one locker room across the down to the second. And they had the, the, the manager there was a great manager. I may have told you last time, Les Moss was one of the best managers I ever played for. He's a catcher. And he said, Frank, when's the last time you pitched? I said, I haven't pitched all year. He said, he handed me the ball and he said, you're all we got. So I pitched against my, my team that night, against Augusta. No decision, pitch well. From that point on, I won 15 games, including the 16th in the playoffs. Bingo. The Yankees grab me back and take me to Richmond the next year. And even though I won 16 games as a starter, they made me, they put me in the bullpen. I mean, you know, just looking at. No, go ahead. You know, just saying, just. You know, they had some other left-hand pitchers they wanted to get get a look at. So while they brought me back, they still, I don't believe, were convinced. So they stuck me in a bullpen. And then I led the league in, complete, in the appearances. That's what I, I'm looking at. These stati- yeah, I'm looking at these statistics. By 65 or 66 with the Pirates, you were averaging six strikeouts a game. I think I believe it was like third on the club. You know, I was not a power pitcher, but I did strike out a lot of people, particularly before I signed professionally. I, I still hold the Notre Dame record for most strikeouts in a game by a single pitcher, 19. Last year, four pitchers struck out 19 for Notre Dame, but I'm the only one that's done it solo. And I also hold the record in Notre Dame for most strikeouts average per nine innings. It's I think it's 12.6. So I still have, but I was not a power pitcher. I did have a, a live fastball, but I didn't, you know, I didn't throw 90 miles an hour. I was probably 80 in the 86 area. Wow. So, so now, so you were a fastball curveball pitcher. By the time you were with Pittsburgh, from what I understand, you had a nasty slider and a changeup as well. Yeah, I actually lost my, believe it or not, I lost my curveball after my year in Greensboro. For some reason, I got the spring training with the Yankees in 1960, which was Stingles last year. I couldn't throw a curveball. I had a terrific spring. My fastball was live, moving all over the place, but I couldn't throw a curveball, so I taught myself the slider, and quite frankly, that's what hurt my shoulder in 61. I, I threw, I overthrew it. I put too much stress on my arm, and I actually caused my own injury. Wow. And I never threw curveballs again in the majors. I threw a fastball slider and a changeup. I wish I had, as a youngster, I wish I had worked more on my changeup because it became a very effective pitch for me. But when I was younger, I didn't want to throw high school player pitch batters and American Legion batters. And even in college, 
I didn't want to give him a chance with a changeup. I thought, I don't need to do that. I'm just going to throw my fastball. <laughs> but in the long run, had I been perceptive or pre I, I would, if I had to go back and do it all over again, I would have worked more on my changeup. I mean, that's amazing. You're not considered a power pitcher, but yet, I mean, you're striking out 19 batters a game. That's really remarkable. There was a reason I struck out 19. We made seven errors in well, that, that game. Right? The shortstop made five of them. If he had just gotten not made errors on regular ground balls, I would have never set the record. <laughs> but, that's, sort of, that's sort of a little funny part about how that happened. <laughs> yeah, no, I, but, you know, the scouting report by the Yankees on you, Frank, was you had more stamina than most big men. Yeah, I Do you remember to, that quote? I, well, Johnny Noon, I believe, is the scout that signed me. I believe he made that comment. And I'll be honest with you, it is true. I used to, I was in excellent physical shape. I ran a lot. I didn't drink a lot. I didn't smoke at all. And I was actually in excellent shape. I could have probably been a long-distance runner uh, if I had an interest in it. And that is true. I think I led the Carolina League in complete games my freshman year. Yeah, and, you know, you had a lot of success against facing those left-handed greats like McCovey, Joe Morgan, Billy Williams. I mean, they used you for those power hitters, right? I did have good success against left-handers when I was with with the Pirates. The irony irony is I didn't have that great a success against the left-handed batters in the minors, for some reason, I didn't have the success I should have. I had good success against strong right-hand hitters because of my tailing, sinking fastball. And, and they wanted to pull the ball, and that was not the way to, 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 to bat off me. The guys that I had trouble with that were right-handed were guys like Mari Wills who wanted to punch the ball to right field. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> and he choked up a lot, right? I never. I had a. I had a. I had a hard time jamming right-hand hitters, and I and I think I know the reason. Now, on reflection, Steady Eddie Lopat, the Yankee pitching coach, showed me how to hold the ball with the seams. The, uh, with the narrow seams, he said that that'll make your ball sink and tail better. And I did that. And that was great. But when I needed to jam right hand hitters, I should have held the ball across the seams, come a little more overhand and have it rise a little bit and stay inside on the right hand batters. That's just something you, you realize years later. But that would have probably helped me jam the right-hand hitters. And I, and, I, and when I started coaching Little League ball, I, I taught the kids the difference. But, and I, but Lopat's the one that showed me how to make the fastball really sink. Interesting. Now, I have a couple of minutes left, Frank. I want to ask you, since you played with Clemente, anything that you can recall? Uh, give, give us some insight on Roberto Clemente. Uh, any, any memories you can share with us? Three you traveled with him? Well, mostly just admiration, not only for the way he played baseball. I mean, he could do everything that the greats could do, except he didn't have quite the power. I mean, he was the equivalent to Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle, Hank Aaron, except he didn't hit home runs. He had, you know, he might hit 20 a year, but he was not a 40, you know, year home run hitter. He could run, throw, and hit with, with the best of them. Uh, and the other thing I remember about Roberto was what a, a good family man he was. Very religious, high moral person. And very and very nice. He wasn't, uh, you know, he, he knew he was a great, but he didn't exactly divorce himself from, from his teammates either. I mean, he, he was cordial. And that's what I remember about him. Well, he's a quiet, was he a quiet guy in the clubhouse or he was yeah, uh, yeah, energized? Yeah. He was. He could be. He can. He was more or less quiet, but he could. He could make his comments from time to time. He had that, you know, 
personality would bingo if he did something caught his attention. He wasn't afraid to express it. Hmm. Now, you know, during but I, your career... But I played with a lot of great guys on the on the Pirates team. I mean, that, to me, I consider my year with Pittsburgh the highlight of my baseball career. The players were great, the manager was great, and the, the, the fans in Pittsburgh were the, were the best. Now, I have uh, one minute left. Now, during your travels with Pittsburgh, who did you ro- room with? I roomed... Uh, Do you remember? You know, a lot. I remember, remember rooming with uh, with Wilbur Wood. Okay. Uh, in fact, we moved in together when his family left to go back to uh, Boston. I remember rooming with Wilbur Wood. Uh, I'm not sure who my roommate was on the road. No. To be honest with you, I'll tell you. Who I've stayed the friendliest with over the years is Don Schwal. Don oh yes, was, Don was on the program. Nice guy. Yeah, yeah. Very nice guy. <laughs> Don and I meet every year in Venice. We played in that charity golf tournament that they have down there. But now the ball players are not asked to be in it anymore. So I haven't seen him for a few years. But Don's the one I was closest to on that team. He and I actually ended up working for the same firm for a while. Uh, he worked. He and I both worked for Payne Weber. Wow. Well, listen. Uh, my time is up here. I really appreciate your time, Frank. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for inviting me. My, my pleasure. You just heard from Notre Dame great 1960s pirate and Astro player Frank Carpin. Until next week, happy collecting to all.